some people put their names on buildings. This is this is the only company I've ever put my name on. And so for me, the ability to change healthcare in this country is everything. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a very special episode of the Healthcare Trailblazers podcast. This gentleman needs absolutely no introduction. Mark Cuban, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me on, Mendel. Pleasure. So the things that you've done with your life are obviously very famous, Shark Tank, all the various uh, companies that you've been invested in. This is different. You've started this company called, you put your name on it, Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drugs, uh, and you really seem to be investing a lot of your personality around it. Um, every single po every single tweet that they tweet out on their Twitter account, I can expect you within hours to retweet it. And yep. so uh, it's really something that 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 you seem to be just just rewrapping a lot of the Mark Cuban personality around. So let's start with why why pharmacy? I mean, do you think healthcare and pharmacy in particular is good in this country? Do you think drug prices are you know um, fair in this country? I mean, yeah. it, there's an obvious need. And so when there's a need and there's an industry that's opaque, it's ripe for disruption. So we went for it. And, um, you know, the fact that it's opaque is what created the opportunity to do costplusdrugs.com because what differentiates us is that we publish our costs. We publish our markup of 15%. We publish exactly what the price is going to be. And by limiting our markup to 15%, we're typically a whole lot cheaper than, than anybody else. And on top of that, the biggest component that's missing is trust. Hopefully you trust your doctor, but people typically don't trust any, anyone else in the healthcare supply chain. You know, you don't know what the economics are gonna be for you or your employer or your family, whatever it may be when it comes to insurance. And so by creating costplusdrugs.com, you know, and introducing that transparency, we're, we're revolutionizing an industry. Yeah, uh, really fantastic. And so, you know, with the cost plus model, it's very interesting because in different industries, that can be a really good thing or a bad thing. I think a good example of cost plus being a bad thing would probably be like in the industrial complex. And not that I'm very familiar, but my understanding is that uh, in government contracting, when they get to do cost plus, that just gives the opportunity for the people to just really up their costs, right? Yeah, if you're just cost plus and you just, you know, you know, make a mess, you know, add all the Michigas to your cost, then, you know, a markup on a, on a non-transparent number can be anything, you know, you can set it to anything. Um, and so, you know, we truly are transparent in our cost. And if you were to talk to our suppliers, you'd see that's our cost. And I think that's the difference. And, and again, the key element really are, are, you know, we buy drugs and we sell drugs at, at a base, but our real product is trust. You know, we want, we want to show you all of our economics so that you trust that you're getting the best price possible. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a really good that's a really good point. That the real product is trust. I love that. And so taking that concept, at the end of the day, you're you, you know you're you're a talented uh, businessman. You could have gone uh, the entire healthcare is extraordinarily broken um, as you kind of started off with. And so what was specifically attractive? Why did you think there was a specific opportunity around around the pharmacy industry when you could have you could probably if you put your brains to it you could probably fix any any segment of healthcare. Not about that, but um, you know the the. Thought process was drugs are not, you know, pills are not expensive to inventory. And so for us to be able to, you know, have an environment where you're not keeping hundreds of millions of dollars worth of inventory, that was very attractive. And they're small, so you can move them very quickly. They don't take long to make most often. And so, you know, that's what opened that door. Love it. Okay. So for the complete novice, let's take a step back. The pharmacy industry. Um, I don't think your average American that that fills their prescriptions at CVS or wherever has any idea uh, the complexity around the business. And so, if we, if if you don't mind, let's take a giant step back and walk us through the various players from the manufacturer to the patient taking that that pill. Who is in the mix? Depends on what direction you want to go, right? So there's a manufacturer. There's somebody who created a medication, right? So there's a pharmaceutical company who developed a drug. It goes through a long trial process, and then it gets approved by the FDA. And then either that company sells it to somebody else to, to market and sell, or they manufacture it and market and sell it themselves. So, I mean, all, all the brand drugs that you see, Eliquis, that are still under patent are examples. Um, and then there are examples of drugs that went off a of patent, you know, and what become what they call generics. And the generics really are where we've started because there's usually multiple manufacturers for each of those medications. And so we can, as we grow and we get more heft and, and more negotiating leverage, 
we can continue to push our pricing down and pass that on to consumers. On the brand drugs, it's a little bit different in that um, typically it's insurance that's paying for them because they're more expensive because they're still under patent. And then it gets a lot more convoluted. And so really, you know, the manufacturer manufactures them. Um, they ship them to the pharmacy. You go get them. But then there's so many other little things that complicate it, you know, um, to the point that, the, you know, if you ask your pharmacist what this brand medication is going to cost, they probably don't know until you give them your insurance card. And even then they don't know until it shows up on their terminal. And so it's just, you know, it's completely opaque so that insurance companies don't always know what they're paying. Companies don't know what they're paying for the, the medications that their employees um, have to get. And the, the patients don't know, you know, all they know is what their copay is. And so it would take days for me to try to, you know, delineate all that in detail for anybody. It's, and this industry has more acronyms than any industry I've ever dealt with. There are just so many ridiculous acronyms. I can't even, it's like I almost need a cheat sheet to keep up with them. And, and that's all the more reason why, you know, we think we're going to have an impact because there is, a, you know, an unlimited need for transparency. And we're starting to, to push the entire industry in that direction. Yes, which we'll get to in a second. And so it, it, I, there's, of all the acronyms, let's, let's pick out one. Um, let's pick out PBMs. What, right. is, <laughs> what is a PBM and why is a PBM? So what PBM started out to be, a PBM is a pharmacy benefit manager. And they started out to do just what the name implies. They worked with um, companies to say, okay, you don't want to be in the business of trying to determine what drugs should be available to your employees. You don't want to be in the business of negotiating prices with the manufacturers. We'll do all that for you. Sounds great, right? Then they started combining with insurance companies. And that now all of a sudden, and where we are today is the insurance company and the PBM company are pretty much sister subsidiaries in, in a bigger conglomerate. And they start working together. So, you know, the price that they negotiate and the price that they pay isn't necessarily shared with the company that they're working with. So for my employees, right, we have a PBM. And supposedly, as I said, they're doing this negotiating for us. But we don't know what the details of that negotiation are anymore. Instead, because they're owned by the insurance company, we know we, the insurance company that we use negotiates now with the PBM, they tell the PBM what they're willing to pay, or, you know, and sometimes it's the other way around. And then they charge us because we self-insure. We don't get any of the details on how that works or how the claims work. It's just insane how, how this whole process works. But you get, you get all these incestuous companies whose original um, design, like the PBMs to negotiate and determine are kind of in the wind now. Now they're just all integrated, incestuous companies that work together to just try to get as much of our, our capital as they can. I, and I, mind my a, ignorance, but like, so it sounds like there's two people paying in that scenario because the insurance is paying, but you're, you said you're self-insured, so. Okay, so there's a couple things. So bigger companies will self-insure, which means that if you, if my son goes and has, my daughter broke her hand playing basketball. She goes to the, the um, hospital and they, um, it's part of our network. We show the insurance card, the hospital bills the insurance company, then the insurance company bills me directly, the company directly, because we self-insure. And so the value add that the insurance company supposedly pay, um, in, introduces is that they put together the network, they handle all the billing, they have a nice app for you. So, you know, they, they define what the network is. So, you know, what's in network and what's out of network. But, you know, we're getting to the point now where we, we don't really need them to do that anymore. But that's the way it works. Wow. So there's two levels of, of the, the insurance and the PBM seems to be unnecessary at a certain point of scale. Yeah. I mean, look, if you think about what the natural benefit of insurance is, it's supposed to be you pay premiums into a pool of capital and if Mendel needs, you know, to pay for his medical bills, the insurance company pays for that. If Mark needs to, the insurance company pays for that. But it's gotten away from that because there's self-insured companies that are that handle 100 million employees, and those companies now are just looking at the insurance companies as a way just to manage all of the money and to manage all the processes. And literally, we start digging into what 
how that's all working in the cost for my companies. And we're going to stop paying, stop paying insurance premiums next year once we can get out of this contract and take self-insurance to the next level, not use the insurance companies to define our healthcare networks, not use their PBM, but hire people to do all the individual roles that insurance companies pay. So the insurance companies do this thing called third-party administration, TPA, right? And what that means is Men Mendel um, needs surgery and you need to get a pre-authorization from your insurance company. Does this sound familiar with your insurance? Yeah, so you need to get your pre-authorization and they make that determination whether you should get that or not. Or they you, you might get prescribed a, a medication that's a little bit more expensive and they make a determination whether or not you can use that medication and they'll pay for it or whether or not you should try a different medication. Those are the roles of a third party of administrator. But if, instead of using the insurance company's third party administrator, we just use our own. We can set the terms and conditions, right? So we can say, we don't want you to deny, you know, because if the doctor says you need surgery, we're going to trust the doctor. If the doctor prescribes this medication, we're going to trust the doctor to prescribe the right medication. We can do audits. Why, the, why trust the doctor? Yeah. Because if you can't, that's the one piece where if you can't trust your doctor, you're using the wrong doctor, right? And you well, have a- Well, it might depend on the incentive structure, right? If the doctor's getting paid in a fee-for-service kind of thing, every time they, they cut, they get paid, then there's less of a, there's less of a reason to trust the doctor versus well, if they're in kind of a value. So we deal with that through our direct contracting, right? Okay. Remember, the whole point here is we're not going to work with the insurance company. We're not going to pay those premiums. Instead, we're going to keep those premiums to ourselves and create our own network. And in working with these own networks, we're going to get a much less expensive price, a third of the price in most cases. And in exchange for that, we're not going to do any denials. But we tell the networks, the network of providers, healthcare providers that we work with, we're going to audit you every year. And if you have unnecessary surgeries, unnecessary prescriptions, we're not going to do business with you anymore. And we'll take whatever legal action or remedies that we have. And because we're a cash paying customer that pays up front, and there's no denials and no prios, they're not gonna do that, right? Because we're their dream customer. And it's a dream situation for us because as an example, with my companies, we're paying $29,000 a year in insurance costs for a, a family of five. That's insane, you know? If you go to, and, you know, just for your own knowledge or anybody else out there, you know, if you are having to pay out of pocket for whatever reason, or you have a high deductible in your insurance program, don't just use your insurance card. Call up the hospital, wherever it is you're supposed to go, and ask for the cash price. If it's a medication, go to costplusdrugs.com and look for it there, because we are a cash price, right? And so, like, as an example, I had to get um, a CT thing done, and through my insurance um, for my companies, it would have been like $2,200. Buying it directly and just paying the cash price, it was like $500. I mean, it's insane. I can give you medications, the same thing. There's chemotherapy, imatinib, right? That will be anywhere from $200 to $2,000 just walking into your, um, your CVS or potentially from your insurance company. Our price is $20 to $50, depending on the strength, right? So there's all kinds of examples of that. And the big company, the insurance company slash PBMs are able to get away with it because there's no transparency. When you sign, how do you get your insurance, Mendel? Um, company plan that okay. I have employees on. Okay. And so how many employees? 25. Okay. So you guys probably have an insurance company like Aetna or whatever, right? And if you look what their actual costs are with the hospital or with the pharmacy, it's going to be a multiple two or three times of what you would pay if you just paid cash price. And if you think, well, I paid my premiums, they're just going to pay it anyways. Well, what they do is you know, if you have a lot of um, costs associated with it, they're just going to raise your premiums next year. And if you're not willing to pay them, the insurance companies don't lose money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the reason. For yeah, and I'm I'm actually a, uh, launching a new a new company and some new employees, and so I'm literally going through this contracting right now. So very very familiar with the pain point. So you, it's tough for 25 employees. Once you get to 50, it gets a little bit okay. easier. Uh -huh. But look at getting catastrophic insurance like Warren Buffett's companies, I forget the exact name of them, so that you know you can set a threshold. For any individual employee, if it costs me more than $2,500, I'm paying this premium, you pay it. 
they literally act only as an insurance company. They don't tell you you have to use this network or that network, right? And then for the whole company, if it turns out to be more than some number you can afford, $100,000 in total for the year, then, you know, um, the catastrophic insurance will pay for it. Kick in. Yeah. And so you can then start setting your own cost and, and premiums and work with it that way to push what you pay to whatever insurance carrier you uses. Yeah. And, you know, and they play so many games. So when you're into it, one of the things, so when you're doing the negotiation and you're looking at the pharmacy benefit, you want to make sure that they don't have a segregated specialty pharmacy and regular pharmacy, mm. right? Because what they, they have do, tiers of drugs is what they have. Yeah, that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. That's, and yeah, that's what they do. If, if it's a pill, it's a pill. Right. But what they'll do is they'll tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one is the low cost stuff. Then it gets a little bit more expensive. Then the tier three stuff is the specialty stuff that they want you to, to use through their pharmacy. And that's where they rip you off bad. That's where they'll charge $2,000 for a matinib and you could just get a cash price from us for $25. And they don't care. You know, they're because they know at a, as 20, with 25 employees, you don't have a lot of options. Yeah. Not a lot of leverage there. Um, which by the way, and I have so many follow-up questions. I don't want to digress too much, but I do want to call out, you know, I've obviously been, been following you, um, on, on, on Twitter for quite a bit. We've in interacted a little bit and, uh, you, you did this one thing where you said that you are going to be releasing your contracts for anybody to be able to leverage that. I, I think people just glossed over that. Am I crazy? Or is that a really, oh, really big deal? It's a really big deal because Right now, as you go through the process of determining what health insurance and how you're going to deal with the wellness of your employees, you have no template to work from. Are you guys using um, an employee benefits consultant? Yeah. How much are they charging you? I don't even know. They send me a thing and, you know. There you go. Yeah. Right. You don't yeah. even know. They know One second, you, you were referring to this, the, the entire, you were, you were referring to like Everything. the fact that you're going to be opening up essentially a, a department to, to, to manage no, actually, what we're going to do is the, the insurance. We're, we're not buying insurance, but the way we handle our healthcare, we're just going to publish it on the website so anybody can copy it. And so, if we have a contract with this big hospital network, or we have a contract with this surgery center, or healthcare, or you know, primary care provider, or group of doctors, whatever it may be, we're going to put our price in our contract up there, just like we do for the medication. And that means Mendel for your company can say, well, let me just see what Cost Plus Drugs is doing. You know, let me just see what other companies are doing. And when we publish those and we'll work with them to publish more. Now, all of a sudden, you don't need that employee benefits consultant. Every time we talk to them, we're like, you guys are trying to put us out of business. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. They were charging, um, they were charging me $30 per employee per month. We have 700 employees, about 1,000 lives with their families. And I'm like, how stupid am I? How dumb am I? Because like you, Mendo, I had no idea what we were paying them. None. And then all the ancillary charges that come through from our insurance company, just they just get you coming and then they get you going. And it's not like the hospitals even like to deal with those insurance companies because when you talk to the hospitals, they're like, well, you know, they're going to deny claims. We have to go through pre-offs. Pre-offs take up HR's time at the companies we work with. And it takes up doctor's time trying to, you know, overcome the pre-authorization denials. Then we have to have all these administrators dealing with the denial, the, the claim denials, meaning after the services have already been rendered. And then on top of that, you know, Mendel's company, they've got a $2,500 deductible, let's say, and each employee is responsible for that. Well, if it's at their hospital, well, guess what? The hospital has to deal with the accounts receivable and 60% 60, 60 of those accounts receivable go bad. And so it's just a bad deal for everybody, which is why we're direct contracting and direct cash pain for everything. Okay. So, so I want to double click on that for a sec. The, the, the central theme of this podcast is value-based care and you're, I'm sure you're, you're, you're very familiar. So when you, when you plan on doing that contract thing, do you plan on, do you plan on going in, in value-based care kind of direction where you're going to want your, your network to be taking risk and you're going to be doing it more of a value-based care setting, or is it going to be fee for service? I mean, both. It just depends, right? Cause some things are aggregated together. Um, you know, a birth, right? Um, but then there's still uncertainty. Is there, you know, is a C-section going to be needed? Um, and you don't know that sometimes until you get there. And so there's, you know, in some cases we might do a value-based care, which is just, you know, one price. And if it's under this price, they get the benefit of the savings. But the reality is it's more about the, the baseline reference pricing because your insurance company, 
when they negotiate with uh, hospital network and providers, they're typically paying 250 to 300% of the Medicare reference pricing. We start at 100% of Medicare and go down. And we're able to get that because we're paying cash up front. The hospital has no risk on the um, copay, right? We're guaranteeing all that to make sure it gets paid. They have no risk on claim denials because we're paying everything day one, right? The minute you walk in the door, you're, you know, our, our credit card is right there or our check's already there to save the 3.5% or 2.5%. And then because of that, we're getting far better prices. In addition, like we mentioned earlier, the doctors don't have to waste their time trying to get the pre-offs approved or overcoming the denials and the 16 layers of dealing with the insurance company, which takes up your time, your employees' time, pisses off your employees, pisses off the doctor, everybody's upset. And so in exchange for eliminating that, we get a much cheaper price. Yeah. And, and, but the truth is, even you doing that is in itself value-based care in a certain way, because the whole idea of value-based care is aligning the financial incentive together with the outcome, right? And so the yeah. fact that you're bringing that in-house is in itself just like bringing down the, the onus of care one, to the guy that's actually paying. <laughs> it's yeah. like... And it's even more than that, because value-based care is you have to have a reference price to know what's value. Right. Benchmark, right. yeah. Yeah, and so if your reference price is that what the insurance company negotiated with the hospital network and it's 300% of Medicare, well, if you get 100% of Medicare pricing, that's pretty value-based care. But that said, you know, where things are packaged together in DRG codes, and I forget all the nuanced nomenclature, but we're still going to be very competitive. But we're open because we do want hospitals to be concerned with our employees' wellness. And so where they're able to come up with new ideas that improve the wellness, even if it's you know, longer term benefit, you know, how do you get people to stop smoking? How do you get them healthier without only shooting them up with Wagovi, right? How do you get them eating better? All those things have wellness implications and really is the, the foundation of the ACO or value-based care stuff that we're interested in. I could, we could go on and on about this, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on to the next. Let's, let's talk about the market at large. Uh, you're obviously made a big splash in the market and seems like as a direct result of cost plus drugs and kind of as, a, as an answer to you, Back in December, CVS put out this cost vantage model that seems to be saying, oh, all right, we're going to be doing this kind of similar to, 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 to Mark Cuban. The funny thing is, if you actually look into it, it does absolutely nothing for the end price. It just shifts the dollars from the pharmacy making the money to the PBM making the, the, the money. But CVS has both. <laughs> and so it ends up in the same in the same pot. What's your yeah. what's what's your take on it? It's shuffling duck chairs, deck chairs on the Titanic, right? Yeah. Not like they're showing their cost. They said, and you know, there's two different companies that do it. And what I've read is like, they get to pick what the cost is, then they mark it up a percentage. I mean, what good is that? Well, they, yeah. And they basically, they, they, they added, they're doing cost plus, but then they added a dispensing fee. And that's where the dollar shift. So the dollar right. shift into this. Yeah. One half more than the other, right? It's just, you know, it's not like they're publishing their costs. It's not like they're publishing their markups. And like you said, you know, on our X and threads and LinkedIn feeds, um, we're, when our prices go down, we pass them on. It's not like, hey, we just picked up another 2% of margin because our volumes have gone up and our costs have gone down. The exact opposite. Hey, we just picked up, you know, with our volumes, we just got a 10, 15, 20, 50% discount and we're passing that on. So you see us, I, I don't think um, we haven't missed a weekday yet, I believe, um, of not having with not having a reduction. Insane. That's like it. No, if you were to ask somebody, you know, we launched Jan January 19th of 2022. If you were to ask somebody January 10th of 2022, if somebody would be reducing prices on a daily basis, they were like, what industry are you talking about? It's not healthcare. Yeah. You know what? I don't think they get, I think, I think it's what we started this conversation with. I think that CVS thinks that you're selling drugs um, and you're not selling drugs. You're selling trust. And that's what they miss. Yeah, but, you know, everybody, when we do our meetings at the beginning, when we're first launching, I'm like, let me reinforce to everybody, what's our product? What's our product? Okay, Mark, we know it's trust. Yes, that's all we sell is trust. We're not going to be perfect, but we'll be honest. You know, and as long as people trust us, we're going to crush it. And, you know, have, being transparent, passing on cost reductions, et cetera, all are fundamental to that. All right, so let's talk about some of the challenges you're facing because you're obviously going up against a behemoth uh, industry. You're going up against the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and so just from poking around a little bit, it seems like 
there's there's so many ways to 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 play dirty here. And I don't even know if this is considered playing dirty, but it seems like there's a couple different challenges that are pretty predominant with with uh, with the model that seem to be unfair. And so you're you're maybe dealing with a bit of uh, you know with them obviously having the unfair advantage of being around for forever. And you, as you said, launched in 22. Uh, and so some of the things that uh, they don't mark Cuban. Uh, cost plus drugs, if you fill your prescription through that, then it does not get documented or uh, relayed back to the pharmacy. So for, um, you know, MedRex uh, reconciliation reports, it basically doesn't appear, um, which is problematic for the pharmacy and creates more, um, you know, obviously more work, more paperwork, more administrative burden. The second thing that I saw is that insurance plans will actually consider their patients to be non-compliant if they're filling, and maybe related to that, if they're filling their their drugs through, 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 through cost plus drugs. So how do you so, how do you approach that? You're dealing with kind of. Let's start with the second. So being non-compliant, that's true. Like if you're working one of the big three insurance companies or PBMs, and your your um your copay is twenty dollars, and with shipping and everything, it's fifteen dollars through Cost Plus. We're just telling employers just give them the company credit card and let them go buy it, and you're not you're not compliant by definition, but no one's going to know any different, right? And okay. we see that a lot. And the second thing is, you know, we have, you know, we, we partner with TruePill, we partner with HealthDine, um, we'll be partnering with others. We have full pharmacy features. And so you can put everything together. And look, it's not like people, they, those companies that you're referring to don't recommend and have partnered with discount, discount cards and they send them to, far, you know, with this pharmacy here, this pharmacy there, you know, I'll reduce this price for one week so you get and move your um, prescription to that pharmacy, which has the same problem. So, I mean, you know, they're being a little bit hypocritical. Our yeah. biggest problem in all candor is just keeping up with the grows. You know, it just seems <laughs> like every two weeks we set a new record in terms of prescriptions in a day. And that's been our biggest problem. That's wild. Um, and yet you're you're obviously still still looking for business. By the way, I love and this isn't kind of directly in here, but uh, a couple months back, you were uh, for a, a couple times you were hitting up Elon over 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 Twitter saying, like, move all like we're going to save you millions of dollars. Um, it's so, it's so, it, it, and I was talking, you know, privately to people that, you know, and you're obviously, you have a very different personality that you seem to have never lost, even though obviously you're a billionaire, you did really well, but like, you seem to have never lost that scrappiness, like that entrepreneurial, like hitting up Elon over Twitter, trying to just sell, sell, sell. Yeah. I'm the most competitive human you've ever met. Right. And so I, you know, and plus I really believe in this, you know, this is some people put their names on buildings. This is, this is the only company I've ever put my name on. And so for me, the ability to change healthcare in this country is everything, and yeah. and something I'm, I'm I really take pride in, and something I really want to do. Yeah, did your obvious uh, emo like energy investment and emotional investment and personality investment in cost plus drugs were were those some of the driving factors behind your recent kind of life changes in regards to to Shark Tank and uh, the Mavs? Not so much. It's more because my kids are teenagers now, and. Um, we don't control their schedules anymore. And so while before they start their own families, et cetera, and go off on their own and live wherever, I just wanted to spend more time with them. It was really simple. So I'd love to, I'd love to double click into that. I have two and three quarter kids at this point. Um, <laughs> um, but so how do you, how do you balance? Okay. So this is actually something really interesting. We had a, we had a, um, we had a community networking event recently and we had this guy come down, fabulous uh, guy who grew his, grandfather's business and his father's it's a third generation dental company and he grew it to a billion dollars in, in, in revenue um fan yeah fantastic guy benko dental great company um it's just him and his brother they own the whole thing like really cool right but at the yeah. end of the day i was so, so we did this round table so i introduced him we did you know great guy and then we did a round table after and i i was like at the end of the day it took you three like it took you three generations like the grandfather took it from zero to a million the father took it from a million to 150 and then he took it from 150 to bill and it's like I don't have three generations in my lifetime. I have one lifetime, you know? And so, and so, you know, guys like yourself that actually went from zero to where you are now is obviously fantastic. But most people, and getting to my question, most people seem to um, not have a holistic sense of success. If it's financial success that they're going after, they typically lose their health, sanity, and family in, 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 in the pursuit of, of that. And at the end of the day, if you're 65, 75, 85 years old and you're looking back, do you really feel good about that? I, I really don't think so. And so I just waited, you know, if I would have gotten married when I was 25 or 35. Yeah. I mean, cause for most of my, at the start of my professional career, I had no balance, none. I was on a mission. You know, I had multiple multi-year girlfriends 
that are not my wife. <laughs> I was just not ready. Literally, I had conversations with, you know, woman that um, I dated a long time was amazing, where it was like your business or me. And I, I went for my business because I was on a mission. This is this is my dream. This is my goal. Um, but as I got older and more successful, it became a lot easier because now people work to my schedule. You know, when you're when you're grinding and on the way up, your customers, your your employees, your business drives your life. And it's, you know, when they say jump, you have to say how high. And I would have missed the baseball games, the basketball games, right? Um, couldn't go to the family bar mitzvah or the friends bar mitzvah, whatever it may be. You know, there was a lot I had to give up on. And so I just waited. And I'm glad I did. And, you know, now because I do have more control of my time and because I don't do a lot of um, meetings or phone calls, you know, I can do everything via email no matter where I'm at. That makes it easier for me. But, and you know, I'm not going to lie and tell you, oh, yeah, I figured out, you know, work-life balance. I had no balance. First you did work and now you're doing life. That was the balance. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. Um, in your in your experience, so kind of on that topic, in your experience, uh, because I, I I feel like there's a crossover. I feel like there's, you know, I am willing to sacrifice uh, certain things in order to not be poor, right? Because that is terrible. Yeah. Um, and so, but there seems to be a crossover where at a certain point you're no longer willing. You, like you have enough, um, you know, financial or physical uh, monetary yeah. success to, to 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 live a good life. Um, and any more is not necessarily going to make a difference to you. But at that point, you're already, you're giving up things that you no longer want to sacrifice, like, you know, health, the health, sanity, et cetera. Do you have any framework on what that looks like? I'm sure you've got a lot of friends that are, what does that yeah. look yeah. like? Where yeah. If we think about my next dollar, that won't change my life, my kid's life, their kid's life, their kid's life, their kid's lives. Right. So it's not about the next dollar. It's about the impact. You know, what can I do? What do I enjoy doing? I'm competitive. I love helping entrepreneurs. I love starting businesses. I love disrupting industries. So if it's something that I love to do, I'm going to do it. If it's something I don't love to do, like you can tell I'm looking a little skeezy right now. I just came right from the gym, right? And so it's just like, I'm going to get my workouts in. I set my, my personal um, health goals, right? And workout goals and try to set personal records on things I do there. And so, you know, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I, I get to define what it is and you know and but that's the result of, of luck and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of work yeah that's incredible uh and you definitely carry that energy of feeling grateful and and uh and you know, i am i try not to take it for granted ever every time i look in my kids eyes i mean it's just like this is why you know and that's what makes it special and i'll highlight the fact that the the the, the thing you chose to say that you that you're grateful for is, is, is when you look at your kid's eyes, not when you fly your jets and when you, you know what I mean? No. Look, that's great for time, right? But time's the most valuable asset you don't own. My dad used to say it, my dad did upholstery on cars, you know, and it was just like, time is everything. And that's why I bust my ass so I can control my time. And that, that gives me more time with my kids, et cetera. Shifting gears just a little bit, you've recently, uh, every now and then, every couple of days, seems like you, you uh, <laughs> seems like in between sets at the gym, you have some extra time and you want to, you want to get, you want to stir some excitement on X. Uh, would love to talk about kind of the state of, of, of Twitter, now X. Um, just, you know, it's very interesting to me. Um, recently, I, did you see this story that went viral on about uh, Jews digging tunnels in Brooklyn? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that, under the synagogues and everything. Yeah. So that that is my synagogue. Like that is my community synagogue. Yeah, those are like those are guys I know. And it was the first time in my life that I'd been on the inside of a conspiracy theory. And it was so interesting to me because anyone in my community knows exactly what happened. First of all, it wasn't a tunnel. It's a synagogue in a basement level. They were digging adjacent to it in an elite, you know, in non-sanctioned uh, attempt to expand the synagogue. That was the story. OK. And right. what was so astounding to me, like that was it, beginning, end, right? Was it bad that guys were breaking, a, you know, the wall of a synagogue? Yes. But was it tunnels? And No. And so what was so interesting to me is I didn't mind all of the, all of the people guessing what was going on, even the anti-Semitic spins on it. Like, you know, th th what I found so interesting was people that had hundreds of thousands of followers and putting out tweets that got 20 million views with stating facts that absolutely had nothing to do with reality. And there's no way that they could have heard that from somebody that, that make thought that that was reality because I know the story and I know that there's no connection. And so this one guy was like, 
These tunnels have been found. Things have been taken. Uh, oh, it's now almost certain that these were used for, for sex trafficking. Uh, things were taken to forensics. There was this, that, and the other, and none of that had any connection to reality. And go guess from today till tomorrow. Go figure out, like, it was wild. Like, guys were like, oh, uh, so it's Chabad. I'm sure you're familiar with Chabad, right? So it's like the headquarters of Chabad. They, so they thought, oh, another Chabad, because you know we have 5,000 centers. There's another Chabad. So they thought it was the same Chabad that happens to be a couple blocks from Jeff Jeffrey Epstein's house. So the tunnel was obviously going from Jeffrey Epstein's house to Chabad. But it was like wild. And it was so ask, interesting to me. Let me ask you a question, Mendel. Other than X, where did you read about this? Other than X, where did I read about this? Um, I'm not really on anything else except LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not really on X either. But yeah, to your point, nowhere. Well, 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 the, 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 the Post had it. Like a lot of papers carried it. That's the truth. Well, they carried that there was a tunnel, but they didn't carry all the conspiracy side of it, did they? No. No. You, they actually try to do reporting, right? So, you know, they try to get to the bottom of it. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. But the point of asking the question is, I mean, that's what X has become. And that's what the algorithm is designed to do, in my opinion. And the way the algorithm worked last time I read it in August is whoever has the most reach and the most um, impact, whoever has the most reach and most followers has the most impact on what you see based off the algorithm. And that's why when you're on X, you know, when people talk about, well, I just signed up for an account and I'm getting shown a whole lot of right wing or right leaning accounts to follow without them knowing anything about me. That's why. And obviously, you know, Elon does nothing to stop it. You know, I don't know if you saw the anti-Semitic um, post that I retweeted. It wasn't because, you know, my, my skin is thin and I was bothered by it. I'm used to it. Right. Like we all are at some level. But I just wanted other people to see just what's going on, you know, and to your point, you know, your story is even crazier, right? I mean, being called Jew ban is one thing or, you know, my favorite is you're not white, you're Jewish. You know, it's that's that's fine, right? People, I want to know who the idiots are. I don't have a problem with them being on Twitter. I prefer when they have blue check marks because that means there's a credit card you could tie it back to. Um, but, you know, I don't care. But in your case, with your story, I mean, my goodness, just the way they took it and ran with it. And probably the Post read about it on Twitter. Yeah. Right? And that's what led them to investigate it further. That's what X has become. And if you look at, if you look at, so Elon follows maybe 500 some people, right? So just the other, so let me take one step back. Where you see me post a lot, it's normally on a weekends, right? So I work out Saturday morning and it's the hardest workout of the week. And so I'm coming there and I'm just sitting on the couch, just, okay, this is the time to recover, relax, whatever. And so I have my Theragun in one hand and then my, you know, I'm looking on my phone and I'm like, okay, Elon's doing what Elon does. Nobody else is going to take him on. Don't do it, Mark. Don't do it, Mark. Post, right? You know, and, and so if you look at the people he follows, just go ahead and look at people follow. I won't even insinuate one way or the other. And just tell me what you notice they all have in common, or okay. 90% of them have in common. They all have the same orient leanings, et cetera. It's insane when you look at it, because you would hope that he wants it to be balanced, right? He wants it to be freedom of speech. But what's happened, every, you know, there's freedom of speech, but you just have to realize the consequence of unlimited free speech. And I'm not saying to not to, he should stop this, right? But when you have hateful speech, which becomes with freedom of speech, it crowds out a lot of the people who don't want to be around that. Very few of us want to spend our days listening to racist or anti-Semitic tropes on a social media platform that's not so social anymore. And so it crowds out people and you get people that may just stop posting. You'll get others you know, that um, will stop using the platform altogether. And the reality is, you know, shout out to Threads. I can have, you know, other than the pharmaceutical industry, which is still strong on Twitter, um, I'll have better conversations about politics or whatever. Even with people on there that disagree with me, they'll, they'll be sane, right? They won't be ridiculous. And, you know, there won't be the intermittent, that's what you, you think because you're Jewish or Jewish, Jews own the world and all that, say, or, you know, end this or end that. Um, that doesn't happen on threads. And it happens all the time on Twitter. 
Yeah, we definitely don't own the world. I couldn't even I couldn't even control my plane, which got stuck in Charlotte last night, and I was scared I would miss this. So <laughs> uh, we're not doing a very good job at the whole control thing. <laughs> Somebody come up to me at my gym, and you show me different you know tweets and everything, and it was a, a kid whose family is Palestinian, which led to a whole another conversation. But one of his comments, you know, I love Jews. I'm not anti-Semitic, you know, but Jews control the internet and media. I'm like, hello, what did you just say? Right? Yeah, we're not that good at it. If yeah. Yeah. that's just yeah. how the world works yeah i think the flip side to the argument is that is that the question is where is the skewing happening because the question is if you take off all censorship what happens what comes out of the world and if the answer is anti-semitism um then that's more a problem with the world than the platform right that doesn't, you're not presuming any algorithms that influence correct what, correct what, what's amplified Right. Yeah. And if the algorithm is defined that the person with so if Mendel or Mark or Joe Biden, let's just say Joe Biden had 200 million Twitter followers, you would see much more left and progressive content than what we see today. Now, if, if let's just and if Elon extracted himself out of the algorithm, which is one of the things I suggested to him, you would see totally different content in your for you. It would just be night and day different because that's the way the algorithm works. So I'm not saying that that there aren't crazy shit that happens in the real world, but Twitter is not real world. You know, 27% of adults are on Twitter, some small percentage of that post, and a tiny percentage of that post a lot, right? And so I, my opinion, I don't have data for this, is that I think the people who lean far right post a lot more and because they feel welcome. Where else can they do it? 4chan or 8chan, whatever it is now. How many places? Reddit, maybe a little bit, but they have much more, you know, control there. It, it's become a home for it. Why wouldn't you go to Twitter to do it? All right. And uh, there's so many topics I want to cover, but um, in, in, in just maybe two or three minutes, let's just hit on the, the DEI conversation. So was that, was your interest in having that conversation uh, what are those like poke at Elon things or was it um, uh, or or do you, like I, I'm trying to understand why you why you're so passionate about it. So I believe in it. I think it's right. And I love fucking with Elon when he takes such a strong position that I think is wrong. You know, I'm not I, I don't give a shit what Elon thinks about me one way or the other. He doesn't care what I think about him. Right. Um, you know, he calls me a racist. He calls me this, whatever. Right. Um, but. When he starts going anti-DEI, and I know nobody else is going to stand up and say, okay, no, here's the other side of the story, and here's the implementations that I've seen that work, and here's the value, et cetera. Yeah, why wouldn't I, right? Particularly since it's so important. And look, I'm not saying DEI is perfect. I think, but I, but, and I'd ask you this question. I mean, my sense is the people who are anti-DEI see it as an ideology, and that that ideology is taking over. And because of that ideology, Schools in particular are gearing kids to, you know, be liberal and those liberal senses are then being passed down into new schools, right? And they're teaching our kids and the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket and it's anti-racist. The Orthodox community thinks a lot of that like that too. I mean, from, from the, the interactions I've had with, um, with people I know that are, yeah, we're very, yeah, we're pretty conservative. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you like the general, like, I think, if you talk about the ideology for a second, the ideology is like this victimized ideology that it seems to push that if you have, right, equality of opportunity, equality of outcome, that's a whole, a whole different argument, but like the equality of outcome conversation, like just because you were dis, like everyone has a disadvantage in life, everybody. And like skin color is not the only disadvantage. Some people are smarter than others. Some people look better than others. Like everyone has a disadvantage. I think you're playing in a false flag, right? Let's talk okay. about equality of opportunity. Where have you ever seen that, not written, but where have you ever seen that in implementation? In any company that, you know, everybody like showed, okay, it said e equality of outcome, right? But let's just say that's truly what they believe, right? Typically when it says equality outcome, it's a school or nonprofit or whatever, as opposed to a business. But let's just say a business says that. How do you even do that? Have you ever talked to anybody who said, now we give examples, some white guy who thinks they got passed over for a job for somebody else, but you've never heard of five people from a company saying, yeah, we all get the same. You know, it's, it's more socialist than, you know, capitalist and everybody gets the exact same amount, has the exact same job and has the exact same expectation. That's a quality of outcome, right? 
but you never see it in implementation. You never see it in the real world. You only see this, you know, that it's written on the DEI page that we're searching for equality of outcomes. Every two, no two people are the same, right? It just, it's impossible for it to actually happen. So when I see people point equality of outcomes, equality of outcomes, that's just wrong because it should be a meritocracy and no two people, that's just a false flag. Look, we have this red herring thing here that says they want equality of outcomes, but no one ever says, here's the example. No, I think an example would be kind of uh, um, um, like you have to have a certain amount of people from different from different backgrounds. Like when you have what are they called? When you have like uh, criteria in, in, in hiring that don't necessarily reflect the talent pool. That's not outcomes. What what the argument well, the outcome would, would be getting the job, right? No, 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 no. That's not what they're saying. Is a quality of outcomes, right? Because they're talking about um, equity, right? And equity is like they show the the graphic of the stools with kids that are different heights and the different height schools so they can see over the fence. And they say, well, everybody wants the equality of outcome, right? Not everybody just has meritocracy and gets the job because you can't hire based off of quotas. You can't hire based off of race, no matter what, right? So that would just be illegal. They talk about equity being a quality of outcomes. They want equality as opposed to equity. But no one ever gives the example of people who are like, here's seven people, they all had the same outcomes. You know, or Mark, let, me add, let me ask you, do you think that the White House press secretary is, a, is the most competent press secretary? I don't pay enough attention. I don't All care. Right, fair enough. All right. right. I figured I'd give it a shot. Okay. You know, the reason I'm so passionate about it and adamant about it is because I just think I talk to Bill Ackman. I read what Elon writes. You know, they're, they create this red flag, this um, false flag, this red herring, right? Quality of outcomes, meritocracy. The, People are people that the people that do the hiring in a lot of cases are the same people or some of the same people that are posting the anti-Semitic tropes, right? That are posting racist tropes on, on, on X. You can't ignore the color of people's skin. Now, legally, you can't use that to make a decision, right? But you can say, I, you know, I want a diverse workforce. And to get that, I'm going to expand the, the pool of, of applicants, right? You can go recruit at HBCU. No, you can go recruit at a rabbinical school, you know, um, a yeshiva to hire kids to, to do a certain job, right? Yeah. That, that part's not against the law, but that doesn't mean that's equity, right? And that's diversity. Doesn't mean you're going to get a quality of outcomes because that's impossible. But yeah. I, like when I, I, I won't mention his name, who was big on anti-DEI, he was like, they, I'm like, they're pushing this ideology. I'm like, who's they? They, yeah, I saw that, yeah, right. Who's they, right? And then the next question is, you don't have the balls to stand up to them. You, they're overwhelming you, right? I mean, I've got three kids. You've got young kids. You know, even if it's a public school, there might be something you don't like. Okay, there's parent-teacher conferences. There's PTAs. There's school boards. You know, we've seen books getting banned. You can do something. Then they find they find one person who gives a speech, right? One person in Georgia who's black and gives a speech about we need you know, more of this or more of that and stands up for themselves. There are activists on every, of every angle in the world, right? And if you just take the activists and show their videos and make it seem like that's ubiquitous, you're just gonna try to scare people and give them more, you know, it's just like with your synagogue, right? You know, and what happened there? They're going to post it. Now everybody's going to think this is true. And when they think it's true, they're going to hate Jews more, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, that's why it's just insane to me that Jews in particular aren't full throttle in support of DEI, right? Not every implementation is good or well done, but conceptually, just, you know, diversity, just giving everybody a chance, going out there and open the doors, only hiring on meritocracy, equity putting everybody in position to succeed. If you know you hire an Orthodox Jew who, um, when the sun sets on Friday, you're not asking them to run the TPL report, right? That's equity, right? And when, if that, that um, Orthodox Jew happens to also be trans and they like to go by different pronouns, who cares, right? Talk about <laughs> no, the yeah. Just like That's a like Nick, yeah. right? Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, right? Mark, honestly, I'm, you know, I would love to do a full hour with you on this. Obviously can't uh, right now. Uh, I've look, I'm, I'm actually today's my birthday. I'm 27 now. Congrats. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, 27. So still, still formulating these opinions, but I, I definitely have a lot more on the underlying lying ideology and just my personal life experience that I would love to like one on one with you. But going back to the underlying principles that I think people don't like is this idea that just because it's two ideas, it's first of all, it's just because you were disadvantaged at some point in your life, don't turn that into a reason to just become a victim and then try to take and then it's the it's the victim mentality that I think bothers people. I like I personally, right? You're you came from you came from nothing, so to speak. Here you are, right? I am 27 years old. Thank God, I moved around all the time as a kid. Like I grew up in Seattle, Washington, Postal Isle, like all over the place, right? Uh, my parents, like there's no there's no family money, period, right? And um, today, thank God, a couple successful companies, a bunch of employees, real estate, like do, you know, I'm happily married, kids, the, the whole deal. And thank you, and I'm, I'm really really happy with my path and. And so does that mean that I don't have an advantage that other, that other people don't have? Of course not. I had a, I had, I have two, two married parents. Like obviously I have a community, I have a, and community gives you network. So obviously there's, there's what there, but at the end of the day, it's, there's other people that have a bunch of advantages that I don't have. And I think that the, the mentality to be like, you know, because I'm a minority in some sense, or because I have a disadvantage in some sense means that other people have to go out of their way to look at me specifically. I think is a, is a is kind of a, a a fly a flawed ideology, and in my personal life experience, I've come across multiple executives, and this is where I think like the the people think it's gaslighting a little bit because everyone's been there where you know there's people there's people all the time that they literally will be like, hi, I'm Mendel, and I'm important because I'm an Orthodox Jew in healthcare, which is a minority, right? And then I turn to these people off camera and offline, and I'm like, when were you actually like? Like, like I'm all about you using this to get ahead in your business. I'm all for it. But like, let's be real. Like, when was the last time you were, you know, you were uh, discriminated against because of this minority issue? Like, come on. And it's always the answer is always like, yeah, no, it's never happened. Like, oh, because I'm 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 a woman in this and this. And I'm looking at this woman. I'm like, let me ask you a question. You are a very successful woman. You have a winning personality and a good product, right? In my, maybe I'm crazy, but when I look at you, that's all I see. Like there's no, there's no, oh, you're a woman, you're a man, you're this, you're that. That's great, right? But the corollary of that is saying, well, you know, Barry Diller owns this media network. Um, Bob Iger is Jewish, he runs Disney. Jews must control everything, right? You can't, anecdotal examples don't prove anything one way or the other. That's not, so when you're running a company, as your company gets bigger, You'll, you'll have to determine, you know, the best way to find the best people. And when you're small, you're going to choose from your local community, every other people you know, people you trust. But as you get much bigger, you need to expand the pool of applicants. You're going to want to find people that other people aren't looking for, right? You may determine that, you know, you need to reach other communities and you need people who have unique backgrounds that don't look like you and give you different experiences, right? Those are things as your companies grow, and this company is much bigger than mine by a log shot, where DEI helps you understand that that's a benefit for your business, okay. right? When somebody stands up and says, you know what, you know, I'm discriminated against for A, B, C, or D, there are people who are going to take advantage of every circumstance no matter what, Yeah. right? And on the yep. flip side, they're going to say, hey, are you an M you know what MOT stands for? No, really? Remember MOT? The oh, yeah, remember MOT. the chart. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so old school, old school Jewish, right? Where it's like, I get emails all the time. Hey, I'm Jewish, da, 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 da. Hey, you know, my yeshiva needs this or that. And because I'm Jewish, there's the expectation, right? And I have no problem with that. I can say yes or no based off the merits of what's going on. And then I'll get churches and I'll get, you know, um, you know, um, whatever, right? Um, and so each one, it's just anecdotal. You can't generalize across the board. So because these people are playing the victim all the time, then everybody that's like them is playing the victim. And this whole ideology is causing all these people to play the victim. So I don't like the ideology. Those are non sequiturs, right? They don't, they don't feed off each other. Like I even read that book, um, um, oh my God, by Chris Ruto, I think his name is, right? The, um, whatever revolution, the cultural revolution, where he talks about the history of, of liberals and the Black Panthers and these that guys. The that Bill Ackman said was like really enlightening? Yeah, it wasn't enlightening at all to me. I mean, it was interesting, right, to get the history and stuff, the Black Panthers and the protests at colleges. It was interesting from a historical perspective. But then he goes on to say, effectively, it doesn't work. Because ideology like that doesn't work. People still have free will, free mind in this country to make their own decisions. You want to play the victim? It's like filler on the roof to overuse Jewish things. You know, um, it's just like the, the 
Fiddler on the Roof, and there's um, who's the guy? Have, have you ever watched Fiddler on the Roof? Damn. I'm sorry. It's a different generation. I can so. sing a couple of the songs for you. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, um, but there's always the beggar, right? Who always tells you why he needs to beg, right? Right. And and so people are gonna people are gonna make their own excuses, and okay, those are the types of people I'm not gonna hire. If you play the victim, I'm not gonna hire you. Now, right. what gets you to play the victim? If there's more of those because of this ideology, maybe, right? But is it ubiquitous? No. Is there some? Okay. No. Okay, but we can. Okay, so let's start here. We can both agree that there are mo there are DEI departments at companies, and they seem to be they seem to be growing in both numbers and, and size, right? Well, they're probably not growing as much anymore because of all the backlash. I mean, that that's had an impact. But I get your point. Like I see more and more on LinkedIn every day, but uh, anecdotally, right? Um, and so I think I think, and this is I, I commented a couple times on on X because I think this is where maybe the the, the fundamental misalignment is. I don't think anyone would disagree with you that if it were to be in your business's best interest and be able to approach a more diverse crowd, right? Great example is in uh, movie directing, right? There's this famous, uh, there, there's a clip that I saw that was like viral a while back and I'm not very good with Hollywood. I don't know all the names and stuff, but there was like, there was a black producer and someone asked him um, why, like, why he directed this movie that was about black people. And he, he's like, it's not a race thing. It's a cultural thing. And his, his example, which to his point, I completely don't understand. He's like me and this guy and this guy understand what a hot comb feels like going in your hair Sunday morning. No idea what that means. Those are his words. And that was his point. And he's like, you know, let me ask you, um, who's the famous Italian um, uh, producer or writer, director, whatever. He's like, Whatever. He's like, this guy who's not Jewish could have done Schindler on the Roof, right? I'm not, no, excuse me, Schindler's List, right? <laughs> Schindler on the Roof. That would be a wild film. Um, Schindler's List, right? And he's like, and this other guy could have done uh, whatever, some, some, like, uh, some Italian movie. And he's like, but they did it because there's cultural differences there, right? And that makes perfect sense. You're going to make a movie about Jewish people. You probably want to understand Jewish life, which, by the way, when it comes to the Orthodox community, is always hilarious to me to your point because they never have any clue they'll have like the wrong yarmulke with the wrong type of community at the wrong payas with the wrong this and it's like it's a total mix-up right they have like a reformed talus with like with like long payas and it's like what is going on here right um and so yes you want those cultural you want those cultural understandings so that's that's you made that point and i think that's a very clear point i don't think anybody would disagree with you i think that where it gets different is when is when you consider it's two things. I think the question is everyone will agree that having a diverse uh, diverse view is is an advantage. I think the question is if not if a lack of diversity. I am a straight white male, right? Is my lack of diversity a disadvantage to me? That's one question. No, it's irrelevant. It's just it's your skills that make the difference, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's your unique backgrounds, being able to tell what goes with what, right? As an Orthodox Jew, right? Being able to understand healthcare. It's but taking somebody from the Orthodox community is a unique set of characteristics, right? Particularly in New York, that may bring a different viewpoint. Now, it's not because you're Jewish; it's because where you grew up and the culture and the people and all that kind of stuff that makes you different. That might be a perspective that would help a business, right? Is that wrong to hire you for those reasons? Right. No. No. Not at all. And so, so that's, that's point number one. So great. We're aligned there. Point number two, I think is, is where I think, I think it makes a difference is if what you're saying spot on, uh, if I am trying to, uh, if I'm trying to, healthcare is a great example, right? Social terms of health, contextual uh, uh, elements to, to people's healthcare. There are cultural things that make a difference in people's health, right? And those are really specific to the community. So if I'm a healthcare company, not only is it good for me to have uh, diversity on my team, I must have diversity on my team because I will never understand what the 67 African American feels like living, you know, living in, in, in his neighborhood. I will not understand that and I will not be able to meet those needs. And that's why, especially going back to the original concept, when you go to value-based care, that's like super, super important. You need that, right? Because you right. need to be able to understand those. So absolutely. But that's very different. Having that, that, that end result and that's the, the purpose for having diversity, that's understandable. I think the, that's very different than saying there's not sufficient representation on the team for the team's sake, not for the client's sake. This team is too white, right? Well, it depends what business you're in, right? It's not so much based off of color. It's based off of experiences, et cetera, right? It could be this team's too young. It's, you know, it, 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 we don't have enough youth. We don't have enough age and experience or wisdom, right? There's a thousand different ways to do it. But like I've said on X a million times, Businesses are going to make those determinations for themselves. You have to make that determination. 
Now, if you think that, you know, um, there, there's quotas, no. You, I mean, they want to pretend there's a lot of people want, like, there's a difference between a goal and a quota, right? So if you have 10,000 people working for you and you'd like, in, in your um, management, you only have three women or three black people or three whatever, right? And you'd like to see more of those, that's not, that's not a quota per se. Why would I want to see more? Why? Why? Because diversity of experiences, right? Maybe. No, let's assume I have the diversity of experiences, but I don't have the diversity of, of, of gender, race. And by the way, Mark, this is coming from a guy that my, my main company that has 25 employees, every single one is women, okay? So just, just FYI. No, I'm, not saying, I'm not suggesting one way or the other, but the question, if the question is why, that's what management's decided, right? That's what the business decided because the flip side is if it's not needed and they're just hiring for the sake of hiring to show off and make it look like it's diverse, they're not going to have qualified people. The people that work with them are not going to want to work with them because they're having to do too much work or the culture's not working. There's going to be a thousand, you know, I'm managing 25 people. If two of them don't get along, then eight of them are not going to get along. Right. And for whatever the reasons are that they're not getting along, you will have a problem. And that department, that group, that floor, that, you know, cul-de-sac in your offices, right? The four cubicles together, they are going to have a problem. And that problem is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the whole suggestion that, well, if it's all good, you know, why would I, I need more of anything, right? Why not go with just more of what I have because it's working? Well, management just makes that decision. And if they feel they need more diversity and experience, what's wrong with that? And if when they hire them and they give them and the equities there and they give them the tools they need to succeed, what's wrong with that? And if, um, you know, the inclusion is there. So it just so happens that they hired the most qualified person who was trans or whatever, right? Um, what, and they gave them the support they need. What's wrong with that, right? Look, I get that if you're a, a white man, I remember when I was getting ready to go to college and there was a, the Baki case, I think it was at UCLA where they um, gave um, an advantage to um, the, a black kid over a white kid, right? In terms of admission, like kind of what we saw with Harvard. And, it, and you know, as I, I thought about it, it's like, it doesn't matter one way or the other. People are gonna make their own choices. The schools are gonna make their own choices. I get to choose what school I go to that, I, that would let me in at the time and that I could afford, because I knew I was gonna have to work anyways to pay for school. You know, who I hire, who I work for, who I partner with, we all make our own choices. I think where the disconnect is, is there the is the perception that there's some master ideology that has this incredible level of influence and control who who is it right and on the flip side who like if if Elon hates DEI so bad why is his company minority majority first of all right um but let's just put that aside you know who is Elon afraid of that supports this ideology, this, this DEI ideology? I don't look at it as an ideology. I've never felt pressured one way or the other in any one of my businesses or situations to hire someone black or orange or green or yellow or whatever, right? I just make my own business choices. And as I've learned over time, the more diverse of experiences I have, the better it is for my business. There's no overriding ideology. I mean, who, when you think of DEI ideology, who do you think of? Who's the first person that comes to mind that supports this ideology? Um, the, I mean, look, I'm I'm by no means the the subject matter expert. I would think that that you know the Biden admin and general uh, and education educational institutions. Um, yeah, I never got a letter in the mail saying that you know, hey, excuse me, you only have. And by the way, back to my example, I didn't try to hire women. I tried to hire really really good care coordinators, and it happens to be, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, so to your point, 100 percent. And that's the way to go. I think that we're having a factual argument, which there's no point in having here because uh, which is this either exists in policy or doesn't exist in policy. Um, but I, I think it's the intent that really matters. And if the intent is to your point, if the intent is to have a better product, have a better system, then there's I, I, I would like to find the person that would argue with 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 the fact that, you know, um, that that's the way to go to hire. Yeah, then you end up with diversity. That's fantastic. Um, but if the if the intent is diversity for the sake of diversity, because if, if I don't show that my team is diverse, then I'm a bad person, which I do think is a pervasive um, mentality with employers. I mean, I, I, I definitely do think so. I think it would look- Doesn't, doesn't the free market and capitalism solve that? 
Uh, so to your point, you're saying that if I go around uh, hiring a bunch of people that are less talented simply because of diversity, then I'm going to fail. And I think that you're oh, correct. I think we're seeing that. Problems. You're not going to fail. That? You're not going to fail necessarily because if it's a big company, but you're going to have problems, right? That that show themselves economically one way or the other. Or yeah, and I think we're seeing that with education. No, isn't that what's going on? Aren't the Ivy Leagues kind of collapsing because of rot in in the institution with this kind of ideology for so many years, and now it's coming to a head? I don't look. Harvard, I think, put Harvard aside and MIT. The um, the the big the the brand names, the big brand Ivy schools are in their own world, right? You know, I don't pay attention to them, but based off of what I've read, yeah, and based off of what Ackman said and everything, I can see in the institutions that's part of their mission, right? They want, but you know, at the same time, they have a hundred thousand people applying in that school, right? And they have to make choices on what they feel creates the best graduate. And if, if it was only based off of SAT scores and you all had one or two or you know, three demographics that represented the whole school, are you gonna get, are the kids that attend, they're gonna be best prepared and get the best education? One second, why not? Why not? Because you're gonna to have to deal with people in different ways in the real world. Right. And preparing yourself for the real world, I think, is a fundamental um, requirement of going to college, learning to show up and learning to deal with unique people and unique circumstances, I think better prepares you. You know, I'm not going to if there's a college that is limit. Well, if, if there's the college that follows one ideology, I'm not going to hire from them because that's not what I want. Right. But that's my choice. Right. You know, I, I like the fact that there were a lot of different types of people where I went to school, where my kids go to school. I think that's a positive because learning to deal with people in different from different cultures is a win, is, is valuable, I think, to my kids. Well, it sounds like you're saying that there's value to letting in less qualified, less. Um, and I think this is the argument. I think it sounds like you're saying that it's, 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 it's worthwhile to to let in people that are less qualified um, less talented, less hardworking, less, uh, for whatever reason, just for the sake of a better, well-rounded human interaction experience. You mean that there are uh, specific metrics that can identify quality and qualification, right? Now, if you think that SAT scores or ACT scores does that in and of itself, maybe add grades, maybe add, you know, a, um, couple paragraphs that they've written in an application, and you can absolutely, with 100% accuracy, determine the most qualified, then we'll disagree, right? Because there are soft skills. Like I have a company called scoutable.com. They make you take a video, play a video game, and they take the, they correlate the performance in that video game to people who are high performing within specific industries. Because the whole concept is, you're not just by grades or test scores or even, you know, longevity within a job, you might not find the best programmer because the, the game helps you helps understand how they think about certain things, right? So it's a different soft skill of ability to find quality employees. And it's the same thing to be used for students as well. People who, and not to generalize, the people I've talked to um, that say, okay, you're bringing in less qualified people, the presumption is, and where I disagree is, ACT or SAT score and grades and even the quality of the school you attend potentially and your essay is all the information you need to determine who's more qualified. Do you agree with that? Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily depends on the application. Like I was never a good student um, and I consider that to my advantage in the real world. Okay, so, so like, you're not into a school yet. Here you are being successful and maybe being around a student who's maybe not done as well with their grades, but is obviously motivated and business oriented, that would be a benefit to fellow students. Correct. But I still wouldn't tell, I still wouldn't expect Harvard to lower their, their, uh, they academics. Increased. They just opened them. They didn't lower them. Right. Academics, you know, my grades in high school weren't amazing by a long shot. I dropped out. Right. But I showed that I was driven and I was curious and I loved to learn. And that's what got me in when, you know, when you talk to them, if it was just academics, I wouldn't have gotten into Indiana. I didn't get into Georgetown, right? You, if you want the most qualified person, you've got to open up to more than just the checklist items that people talk about when they deal with qualifications. You know, if I'm hiring somebody 
and I want entrepreneurial skill, I'm not asking for your grades from college. So, okay, I hear your point. They've broadened, They've your argument is that they, they haven't lowered their expectations, but they've broadened the expectations to allow people that don't necessarily fit the uh, the uh, educational uh, smart you know book smart kind of kind of mold to come in to well better round their students. That's the argument. Let's pick your company, right? You have twenty five women who work for you, right? Now, when you sat down to hire them, you didn't send out to have you fired anybody? Has anybody left? So think back to those people, right? When you hired them, you didn't hire them thinking they were unqualified, did you? Right. And did, have you learned from the people you've had to fire on what works and what doesn't work when you hire? Absolutely. Right? That's the point, right? So now you look at different skill sets and different traits that allow you to determine who's the most qualified. And when you look at that realm of different traits, it's not qualitative, it's not quantitative at all, is it? It's not, you know, maybe how many years you worked at one job you know, whatever, but you've learned more on how to interview people and what, how to determine qualitatively who's the most qualified. And that's the whole point. When you have 20, when you have a hundred people applying for your next job, there is no one metric or two metrics that you use to pick who's the most qualified, is there? No, but at, to the same point, I'm a business that does care coordination. So I wouldn't want a uh, creative dancer or an artist to come on the team just to learn that that's not Exactly. Right. So you're not going to hire somebody because they don't meet those qualifications, but your qualifications evolve over time. You know, it may well be in three years because of AI, you need to be able to be great at prompts. And so the person who's qualified today won't be the least bit qualified in three years and you're going to have turnover. Right. So who knows? You're going to have to broaden your pool of people that that you um, um, interview. But the bigger point is, when you look at the range of people that you interview, there is no one set of metrics to determine who the most qualified is. You end up talking to them to try to get a feel. And to say, you know, it's just a meritocracy, when those people walk in the door for you to interview, you don't know just by looking at them or their demographics or anything, who's going to be the most qualified. And more often than not, we all have turnover and you're going to learn the hard way who's the most qualified. And you're going to talk to the people who work for you, given you only have 25 employees. And you're going to ask them, who do you know that can fit this position for somebody who just left? And that's going to be how the referral will be, will carry greater weight, um, weight than anything on a resume, right? So the, the, again, the point is in diversity, it's not about equal outcomes in hiring. It's hiring the best person, but there is no one metric to determine who's best. You learn and you evolve and you try different things to figure it out. Diversity, the D means you expand your pool. So maybe there's somebody somewhere else that you didn't even consider because yesterday before you had, you know, this turnover or that turnover or a year ago, this was your criteria. Now you learned and now you found this new person who changed your criteria again because they're great and people like that person and their experiences are great too. There is no one metric. So when someone says, well, DEI, you're not hiring the most qualified person, it's not a meritocracy. They've never hired multiple people in their lives. Okay, so let me ask you, let me ask you this. Would you disassociate gender and race from your from diversity? I mean, it, it doesn't really matter one way or the other, right? Oh. It's life, life experiences. Right, that's my point. It should, be, it should be about your experience because you can hire an Orthodox Jew um, to fill, you know, that, that to, to relate to the Jewish Orthodox community, but he grew up in Montana all by himself, you know what I mean? And doesn't have any association. And so you, ch you like, you're, you're, you're putting a, a square. DEI is not about hiring to check boxes, right? DEI is expanding your pool to try to get more qualified candidates, knowing that, you know, if most of your employees come from the Orthodox Jewish community, right, there may be better employees outside the Orthodox community. How are you going to find them? Right, it's but I'd be hiring for experience. Right. I'd be hiring for a point. I'd be hiring for cultural relevance. I would, I'd be hiring to connect with my demographic. I wouldn't be hiring for something as, 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 as superficial in my, in my estimation as gender race. I'm looking for equality. No, you can't do that, right? So that's the whole point. The anti-DEI folks that I come in contact with, right, are like, it's quotas, quotas, quotas. I gotta have X amount of this. That's not how it works. Right now, if you go to the colleges and they want to have that mix because that's what they think is going to create the best student and the best outcomes, that's a different conversation. And there was just the Supreme Court ruling that said, OK, you can't do it this way. Right. They may have thought it was better. They have to change their business model. 
I would have liked their old business model better because I want you know my kids to be around a diverse group. I think that prepares them better for life. They deal with it the way they do. But a college is not the same as your businesses or my businesses, right? They're run with completely different objectives. And any for-profit business that runs just based off of numbers, I got to have this mix this way, it's going to show up in the numbers. And where you see companies saying, I want more women or more this, that's where they've made, you know, they didn't say I needed 100% women or 100% minorities. They said I wanted more, you know, IBM, I think, came out and got a lot of shit because they wanted to increase their minority representation by 30% of women, but not including Asians because they're overrepresented um, in the technology industry, right? But they made that determination that they wanted more because someone decided that they needed different viewpoints of different backgrounds. They didn't say they had to hire seven women this year. And by the way, the um, big companies with more than 100 employees have to file this thing called EEO-1, right? Where you have to give the actual number of employees every year by demographic, including you know mixed race. And so you can go and look at these companies and see what they actually hire. And there are companies that have said, here's our goal, you know, we'd like to hire more of this. And in reality, they hired less because even though they tried and they increased the, the, the pool of applicants, they weren't able to find qualified people. And, you know, people leave, people retire, whatever, get sick, you know, you, so you're going to have turnover in those, those numbers. It, it's, you know, there's no, in all of this though, it's not like we said, well, this is what so-and-so told us to do, right? It's not like, I think the IBM CEO feels pressure because again, my business or his business and any other business is either going to be successful or it's not either the stock price is going up or it's not. And if you look at the top market cap companies in this country, they all have DEI programs. And you talk about go woke, go broke. I see a whole lot of companies, more, more companies go red, stay red, right? You know, experience ready then vice versa. Right, but maybe that's just the flip side of the same ugly coin. Maybe that's that's just going in the opposite direction, which you end up with the same thing. At the end of the day, if you if you select for hard, hard right winger, you're still not creating a good, you know, capitalistically minded platform. Right. Exactly right, right. And that's the whole point. The market will tell you if you're doing the right thing. And yeah, yeah bigger companies can absorb some losses and some stuff and you know, and if you're that bureaucratic a company and yeah, you have 100, 200, 300,000 employees, you're bureaucratic at some level, but your systems and your managers, you don't hide that stuff forever, right? And it shows up at some point. If your turnover rate is going up, you're going to have to respond. You know, if you can't hire people because everybody says, I don't want to work there, you know what they're doing? They have this DEI program where, you know, it's exact quotas and no, people aren't going to work there. But when, but so much of the anti-DEI crowd, they just sit around and they say, look at this guy, look what they were saying. I, you know, and they tag me on, on extra threads, right? We're like, this guy said this, yeah, it's ridiculous, but he's an activist trying to make a point, right? Just like Elon talking about electron, electric vehicles, right? He's making that point all day, every day, and there's nothing that's going to influence what he says. If you're an activist that thinks there aren't enough um, African-Americans within the workforce in general, you're going to be pounding that table on that. If you think there's not enough Orthodox Jews, you're going to be pounding that table. If you're going to think, you know, there's racism or anti, you're going to be pounding. That's what activists do. That's what they're supposed to do. That's why they're activists and not passes, right? Yeah. Okay. That, 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 I think that's a really, really good point. And I do think that people don't have the, don't have the, the, you know, the contextual understanding to be able to delineate those kind of things. Um, are you a Seinfeld guy? Do you watch Seinfeld? Yeah. Do you remember Mickey, the the little person on the on the show? Yeah. So I had him on the podcast a while back because he's a big activist for for the people the disability community, and uh, he was basically saying, oh, he's pushing for all these quotas and all these really hard line things. Um, and I we kind of had this similar conversation where I was like, don't you think it's kind of like at a certain point, like at the end of the day, you guys are what percentage of the population? Like we're not going to build the world for disabled people, right? Like that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be inclusive and, and, and sensitive and build options, but like you're not going to build the world with ramps instead of stairs. You're just not going to do that, right? Um, and so like at what point do you, and he said the same thing that you just said. And so I actually really appreciate that. He's like, look, to a certain extent, we're shooting for the stars so that it's heard and so that we're making a point. And I think that's all the time, right? If you're an activist and you're not, you know, your, your life's work is activism, and you're not, it's not a moonshot, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, love it.
Mark, you're, you're, you're an absolute beast. I appreciate you doing this. Did that change your perspective at all? Did you change my perspective at all? I think that uh, I still believe that there are people, to your point, like we just said, I think there's a lot of activists out there. And I don't believe that something as superficial as race or gender should, should sway you one way or another. You shouldn't discount somebody because of race and gender. You shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, consider somebody. That is illegal to do. I know that, but that doesn't. Right. So we agree there. OK, um, that I think uh, I, I, I've always seen, I think, the middle argument from your point. I don't think you're, you're, you're saying that this reality doesn't exist. You're just saying that if you're trying to create a purposeful, comp uh, a successful company or successful organization and you want to divert, then diversity literally means diversity of, of, of perspective so that you can reach a broader, uh, a broader market. And that's obviously going to be a positive thing. And if that means that your, your team is more uh, diverse in regards to their uh, culturally and communally and, uh, you know, then I'm, then yes. I think I think you've clarified it for me where you where you are. And in, in terms of ideology, who do you think is driving the um, DEI ideology? Is there any person you can point me to or because I know who's against it. That's always really clear on on Twitter. Right. But who's who's driving this that has such cultural influence that companies are responding to them? I just think people glom on. You know, when I talk about Twitter being an echo chamber, right? It's so easy just to grab things from Twitter and go with it. And if you go with it, you look for somebody who reinforces your perspective. And that happens and, and people's, people get stronger and stronger and stronger in their perspective. And so I think that happens a lot on X. And you get the exact opposite conversation with anecdotal um, examples of people who disagree with it on threads, right? And even, even on LinkedIn. And so, you know, I just don't, see this big ideological wave that's taking over the country, you know, it, it's like you talk about, you know, little people, right? Um, not being a, a big percentage of the population, like trans people, like the whole thing with Bud Light. She, that person had 250,000 followers. It, people didn't find out about it by following her feed, right? They found out about it because Fox and all of them and X just, beat the hell out of it. It's just like, you know, the, the synagogue thing with the tunnels. They just beat the hell out of it. And yet people use that as a foundation for their beliefs. And to me, that's the underpinning of the anti-DEI movement where they get certain people just pounding it and that reinforces it. And, you know, unless you tell me this is, you know, the experience you've had with these 10 people having equal outcomes, literally having equal outcomes. Right. Or this person really having all this influence over so many people and they just can't resist following them like a cult, like MAGA. Right. Why are these people following Trump? Because he's Trump and that's what they've all agreed to do. I just don't I just don't see it. Do you still directly hire and fire? Or? No, I have it in years and years. I was never very good at it because I'm a salesperson at heart and I always found the best in people. I'm like, oh, this person will be great because I can help them do this, this and this. And they were all not very good. So I, I um. I had other people do it. It's funny because on Shark Tank, you, you're you very different. On Shark Tank, you seem to see people right through people. Yeah, because they're pitching me a business and that's an investment as opposed to a hire. Yeah, it, you, know, you talk to me about any business, I'll figure it out in 30 seconds or less, right? That, that's what I can do. But if it comes to hiring people, you know, sell me this pen, <laughs> you, you know, um, you're going to get the job every time. Mark, uh, this was awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, Mendo. Really enjoyed it.